The title of our talk today is I Wish I Weren't in the Land of Cotton, H.L. Uh, Mencken, Richard Wright, and the Jim Crow South. So we'll start with Mencken because Mencken is really a precursor uh, to Wright. And uh, there you see various pictures of this Baltimore journalist, more on that in a second. Uh, you can see here in the lower left-hand corner, Mencken lived in Baltimore in a row house on 1524 Holland Street. Many of those row houses look exactly the same. And Mencken once wrote an essay about uh, it can be difficult to find where you live if maybe you've had a few, a little bit too much to drink. Uh, <laughs> Here you see Mencken at the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. Clarence Darrow making an argument there. Mencken celebrating at the low, underneath uh, this photo here, Mencken celebrating the end of prohibition with a beer. Here is Mencken and his love for music and his Saturday night club, uh, which met and played music for, I think, almost 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the De Galleys of the American Language, and then Mencken in his later years after his the stroke in 1948 that debilitated him for the rest of his life. So who was H.L. Mencken? Well, he was a reporter for the Baltimore Evening Sun newspapers, uh, grew up in Baltimore, lived there all his life, and he loved being a reporter, and that's really who he was above all else, but uh, he was many other things as well, as we'll see. Uh, and he once said he never he never went to college and he was glad he didn't. He said that as a reporter, as a young man, he was living the maddest, gladdest, damnedest existence, none of them in schools. And as we see today, we'll see, he really didn't care very much for people such as myself, professors, <laughs> or what he called chalky pedagogues. Uh, as a young man, he was the first uh, American to really write an analysis of George Bernard Shaw's plays. And he wrote uh, the first book on Friedrich Nietzsche in uh, America, The Philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. And it has one of the greatest opening lines, I think, uh, you can have to a book where he says uh, that Friedrich Nietzsche was a preacher's son brought up in the fear of the Lord. It is the ideal training for sham smashers and free thinkers. Now, the premise of our talk today, because this talk is mostly about Richard Wright, but it's about Mencken and Wright, is the importance of writers. And uh, Percy Shelley in 1821 said that poets are really the unacknowledged legislators of the world. In other words, they set the tone for, even if it's an in, in an indirect way, for how we think, what we think, what we consider, or, as Christopher Hitchens once said, and I like this phrase and dug it out this morning, he said, the sword, as we have reason to know, is often much mightier than the pen. However, there are things that pens can do and swords cannot, and every tank has a crucial flaw, its driver. Suppose that the driver has read something good lately or has a decent song or poem in his head. I like that. And Mencken and Wright were, they shaped our world and we're gonna, and the way we think about it. So we're gonna talk about them today, okay? Um, <clears throat> and I think this is a new book out on the importance of the great books by Roosevelt Montas. And he makes the point that even though a lot of the great books he, that he read at Columbia went over his head, he said, nevertheless, they were like a recurring tide that leaves behind a thin layer of sediment each time it comes. They eventually coalesced into an altogether new sense of who I was and the possibilities of my life. And so one of the things that Steve and Cindy and I are gonna do today is to hopefully offer you some possibilities about thinking through the lens of H.L. Mencken and Richard Wright. Mencken himself, why look at him? Well. As Walter Lippmann once said, he was the most powerful person on a whole generation of young people. This holy terror from Baltimore is splendidly and contagiously alive. He calls you a swine and an imbecile 
and he increases your will to live, Lippmann said. Um, Charles Fetcher, who wrote an analysis of Lincoln's thought in the 1970s, said this, and I thought this was a good uh, analysis as well. To say that the issues about which Lincoln wrote are dead is true enough, but they are dead precisely because he killed them, because the battles that he fought, he so thoroughly won that the very memory of the war tends to fade into the distant past. The man who buys a case of beer at a neighborhood store or sips a martini in a cocktail lounge or who buys a book without having to ask himself whether someone else has first passed upon it may never have heard of Lincoln, but he owes to him much of the freedom that he enjoys. The world he lives in is in very large part one that Lincoln made. Lincoln himself saw himself as a man in revolt against his time. And he thought that was good. He was in rebellion against what all the average men around him regard as true and good and beautiful. His best work is always done when he is in active revolt against the culture that surrounds him. And of course, this was something that Richard Wright, I think, would have agreed with. And here is one example of this, Mencken's attitudes towards religion, where Mencken thought he said in 1925, religion is fundamentally opposed to everything I hold in veneration, courage, clear thinking, honesty, fairness, and above all, love of the truth. In brief, it is a fraud. Mencken himself was the editor in the 1920s of the Amer American Mercury. And there's a lot of ways that we can look at him. We can look at him as a philosopher, even though his thought was never quite that profound. We can look at him as a political theorist. We can look at his style, his studies of language, and his role as a critic. I'm going to focus on two things today, and then I'll turn it over to Cindy and Steve as they talk about Richard Wright. I'm going to look at the style of Mencken and his role as a literary critic in the American Mercury magazine. You can see the picture of the Mercury there to the right. Here is an example of Mencken writing about President Warren Harding's speeches. Mencken said, he writes the worst English that I have ever encountered. It reminds me of a string of wet sponges. It reminds me of tattered washing on the line. It reminds me of stale bean soup, of college yells, of dogs barking idiotically through the endless nights. It is so bad that a sort of grandeur creeps into it. It drags itself out of the dark abysm of pish and crawls insanely up the topmost pinnacle of posh. It is rumble and bumble, it is flap and doodle, it is balder and dash. And he tosses this off in an afternoon's work, as the critic Jonathan Yardley once said. You see the exaggeration there, the comparison of a president's speeches to stale bean soup and college yells, it's just hilarious. Or in talking about the White House, uh, Mencken once said, as democracy is perfected, the office of president represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be occupied by a downright fool and a complete narcissistic moron. And Mencken is writing this in the 20s, and he took on Republicans and Democrats. He did not care, as you saw, for Warren Harding, and he absolutely hated Franklin Roosevelt. Now, he could be cruel, too. And he wrote this about William Jennings Bryan uh, after the Scopes trial. Bryan died about a week after the Scopes trial. And you can see here where Mencken calls Bryan a vulgar and common man, ignorant, bigoted, self-seeking, blatant, and dishonest. It was hard to believe watching him at Dayton that he had traveled, that he had been received in civilized societies, that he had been a high officer of state. He seemed only a poor clod like those around him, deluded by a childish theology full of an almost pathological hatred of all learning, all human dignity, all beauty, and all fine and noble things. He was a peasant come home to the dung pile. Imagine a gentleman and you have imagined everything that he was not. So he could mix in uh, some really sharp cruelty as well as humor into his writing. And that was part of his style. And it was what appealed to a lot of people in the 19. Uh, 20s, this attack upon what everybody assumed was true. 
or a couple of other uh, aphorisms of his, his definition of Puritanism, the haunting fear that someone somewhere might be happy. Or he once said, uh, whoops, that one horse laugh is worth 10,000 syllogisms. Or he also called historians, I don't know what happened to my animations there, but he once called historians nothing more than unsuccessful novelists. <laughs> there we go, there it is. Mencken, historian and unsuccessful novelist. Now, he also, he was also important in inventing words in America, some of which you may have heard. He called Americans oftentimes, oftentimes the Du Bois. Uh, uh, he, uh, he was the one that labeled the Scopes trial, the monkey trial. Uh, he coined the term the Bible Belt. Uh, he used the word ambibulous to describe his own drinking habits, meaning that he enjoyed drinking during prohibition and, and after. And in reference to people who were conformists and went along with the crowd, he often called them goose steppers or knee benders or, or marchers in parades. Uh, what great phrases there. Uh, Mencken was well known as a literary critic, along with the drama critic uh, George Jean Nathan of the Smart Set. And in the 1920s, he edited his own magazine, The American Mercury. And here is where, uh, in his writings, that he becomes an inspiration for Richard Wright. Okay. Uh, and Link Mencken said that his role as the critic, as he conceived it, is to find out what an author is trying to do and to beat a drum for him when it is worth doing, and he does it well. And most of what Lincoln, Mencken read was garbage. He plowed through probably thousands of worthless novels as a literary critic for the Smart Set and for the American Mercury. But he found those diamonds in the rough, and when he found them, he promoted them. And let me just give you a couple of examples in the American Mercury and in the Smart Set. He promoted Theodore Dreiser, uh, of Sister Carrie fame. He promoted the work of Joseph Conrad, the Heart of Darkness fame. He promoted the work of Sinclair Lewis, who I think won the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, later on. He promoted F. Scott Fitzgerald's work, uh, and he promoted and inspired, and Cindy will talk about this in a second, Richard Wright. He also promoted or the work and inspired the work of Julia Peterkin, in the South, uh, and he was a big promoter of <clears throat> Willa Cather. Uh, there is not one among them without a debt to Mencken, Charles Fetcher wrote, for his literary freedom and the quality of his audience. He, and these writers, they cleared the way for Hemingway and others, and uh, so a very important figure that you may never have heard of. But the Sahara of the Beaux-Arts was one of his most famous essays, published in 1920, and Beaux-Arts was a play on Beaux-Arts, and this came out in his book, Prejudices, Second Series, in around 1920. And he had written a previous essay in 1917 that had come out in the New York Evening Mail, but this was a longer critique of the South. Now, what's going on in 1920 when Mencken writes this essay? Well, uh, we're on the heels of World War I, and Mencken, had, uh, who had, was of German ancestry, he did not think that the United States should have gotten involved in World War I and was quite, quite critical of that, and he lost his column in Baltimore newspapers because of that. And then, of course, it is also in 1919, 1920, the beginning of Prohibition, uh, which Mencken would thought was just barbaric, barbarous. This is also, also the beginning of the great migration of African Americans out of the Jim Crow South. And um, Mencken uh, is writing in that context, and Steve will talk about that a little bit later in his uh, talk on exile and Richard Wright. Okay, so why Sahara? Well, in part because it's in revolt of, of the times. He also wants to attack Puritanism, what he calls Puritanism in literature. He wants to attack white culture in the South, I think, and Anglo-Saxon pretensions there, as well as to maybe attack England as an indirect impact uh, as well. 
So one, one quote from the Sahara, the Beaux Arts, and then I'm going to turn it over pretty much to Cindy and Steve. In all that gargantuan paradise of the fourth rate, there is not a single picture gallery worth going into, Mencken wrote, or a single orchestra capable of playing the nine symphonies of Beethoven, or a single opera house, or a single theater devoted to decent plays, or a single public monument that is worth looking at, or a single workshop devoted to the making of beautiful things. Once you, have account, once you have counted James Branch Cabell, a lingering survivor of the ancient regime, a scarlet dragonfly embedded in opaque amber, you will not find a single Southern prose writer who can actually write. And once you have, but when you come to critics, musical composers, painters, sculptors, architects, and the like, you will have to give it up, for there is not even a bad one between the Potomac mudflats and the Gulf nor a historian, nor a philosopher, nor a theologian, nor a scientist. In all these fields, the South is an awe-inspiring blank, a brother to Portugal, Serbia, and Albania. <laughs> and this is, th this is just one passage. I could read you more, but I provided a link to the Sahara of the Beaux-Arts in the chat box, and you can click on that link and see and read for yourself. So this indictment of the South, it shocks and awakens people there. Uh, it leads to new literary magazines uh, devoted to serious uh, literature. Uh, Julia Pet Peterkin, the ed editor, I believe, of the reviewer here, uh, uh, one, Minkinism, a literary, becomes a literary force in the South. In the lower left, you see Thomas Wolfe, the writer, James Branch Cabell, in the upper right, and then, of course, there were those who attacked Mencken later on, the agrarians in their book, uh, I'll Take My Stand, but most importantly for our purposes today, Mencken was an inspiration for the writer Richard Wright. And on that note, Cindy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Richard Wright was born in 1908, and he passed away of a heart attack in 1960. He was born in the Deep South, and uh, he had an aversion for religion because his grandmother and his mother were extremely religious. So he saw it as uh, as being somewhat backward. And once he read Mencken and he heard Mencken, Mencken express those thoughts on religion, he was also inspired by that, and as well as the, criti the criticism. When he moved to um, Memphis, he was working as an optical, making eyeglasses in some way. And he was able, a library card from one of the, one of the guys who worked there. And by getting the library card, he was able to forge notes uh, to get books. And he also was a newspaper boy, and he uh, was able to read that way. But in reading, Minkin's criticism of the South, he was all inspired, which is understandable because uh, Minkin was able to take lynch lynchings and say basically that the South had no other entertainment except to lynch people. So he was able to use sarcasm and mock it. And Richard Wright was just so all inspired by how Minkin used words to fight and degrade the South, and he wanted to do the same thing. Um, next slide. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. Fighting, he was fighting for personhood and black manhood. Above all, he wanted to be respected as a man, as a human being. To write, the South had dehumanized black and especially black men. He said, how can a black man be a man if every time he manifests his will, he's crushed by white oppressors? Wright believed life could be lived with dignity, that others should not be violated because of race or personality, and that man should be able to confront other men without fear or shame. The problem that I think as to why Wright's works and the two most popular black boy and native son are not as popular today is not only not only do they present disturbing imagery, but Wright was um, as a chauvinist, as, as John said, it was they had ideas that were not necessarily acceptable or that are not 
acceptable today. We can't understand uh, maybe why and how they promoted uh, certain ideas, but right uh, because of the women in his life, his mother and his grandmother and how they used religion as a way of teaching, and he had several lashings and beatings, he tended to have a, a disrespect toward women, if I can say it that way. When he worked, and, and that's kind of sad, because that, that's what got him into trouble. So when he was working with women in the 19, uh, late 1920s and 30s on literary magazines, he took over and projected himself in a way that he disregarded them, their writing, and their works. And it was detrimental to, uh, it was detrimental to him in the public eye, in the public sphere, even though he was popular for, uh, for writing a Black Boy and Native Song. And I think that's maybe why he's not studied as much today as part of the Harlem Renaissance writers. Next slide. But he used, he did learn to use words powerfully. And I'm going to read an excerpt from Black Boy. And he was, uh, he was very critical of white people and, and, and uh, rightfully so, because he understood the reality of being lynched. He understood the reality of, of the South and he understood the reality of following of that of following Jim Crow. But this is when he was in Memphis and he was working for the optical company. Uh, he has an exchange with a couple of uh, fellows in the office building, you know, blacks working. White folks just don't think, old man Edison would say, you sure got to watch them, day the night janitor would say. Falk sent me uh, to have a suit press, I would say. He didn't give me a penny, told me he would remember it on payday. <laughs> Ain't that some nerve, John would say. But you can't eat his memory, Shorty would say. But you got to keep on doing them favors, old man Edison would say. If you don't, they won't like you. And that's an excerpt from page 230 in Blackboard. Also in that same chapter that I didn't put on the slide, they used the form of subversion to get money. And if Shorty, the character Shorty, worked the elevator, when he needed lunch, it, it's, a, it's a graphic section in there where he would start joking with the white men in the building and bend over and basically let them kick him in the behind so that he could get a quarter. And Wright felt that was very, very dehumanizing. He didn't like, um, he didn't like for black men to be seen uh, in that light by white people. He had a lot of self-respect for himself. So $5 to fight. There's a section uh, in the text where a white man try to, tries to pit the two black men together by telling them this, you know, that they're saying things about each other, but they really haven't said anything about each other. The white men just want to see them fight. And one of the one of the men wants they wants to fight because he wants the five dollars, even though they've talked about how they know the entire thing is staged. Because Wright hadn't said anything about the young man, and the young man hadn't Harrison hadn't said anything about Wright. But Wright tells him, I don't want to fight a white man. I'm no dog or rooster. I want to make and Harrison says, I want to make a payment on a suit of clothes with that $5. But those white men would be looking at us, laughing at us, Wright said. What the hell, Harrison said. They look at you and laugh at you every day, nigger. It was true, but I hated him for saying it. I ached to hit him in his mouth to hurt him. Um, next slide, please. So Wright had a lot of pride. He didn't want to condescend or be condescended to in any way by white men. Above all, he wanted to be respected as a man. He wanted to be human and wanted others to respect him in that way. He subverts Jim Crow by forging a note, which got him into the library to read Lincoln for the first time. You can press it one more time, John. So Falk, the same guy who uh, 
to, he ran errands for to the cleaners, let him use his library card and bought that a card in his wife's name. So Wright had free reign of the library through uh, Falk's library card. And the first note that he forged, he says, Dear Madam, will you please let this nigger boy? And Wright says, I use the word nigger to make the librarian feel that I could not possibly be the author of the note. Have some books by H.L. Mencken. So that's the way he was able to subvert the Jim Crow system by uh, using language in a way that got him what he wanted. And when the lady, when the librarian looks at him and he's thinking she's going to make a phone call, he tells her, I can't even read. And she believes him and she goes and gets a couple of books by H.L. Mencken. And he talks about how he stayed up all night long reading those books. And next slide, please. And how he realizes that uh, Mencken was uh, fighting with words. And he said, I wondered what on earth this Mencken had done to call down upon him the scorn of the South. The only people I'd ever heard denounced in the South were Negroes, and this man was not a Negro. Mm -hmm. And he says, that night in my rigid room, while letting the hot water run over my can of pork and beans in the sink, I opened the book of prefaces and began to read. I was jarred and shocked by the style, the clear, clean, sweeping sentences. Why did he write like that? And how did one write like that? I pictured the man as a raging demon, slashing with his pen, consumed with hate, denouncing everything American, extolling everything European or German, laughing at the weakness of people, mocking God, authority. What was this? I stood up trying to realize what reality lay behind the meaning of the words. Yes, this man was fighting, fighting with words. And that so inspired him that he, next slide please, that he decided that that's what he wanted to do. And so Wright said, it was not a matter of believing or disbelieving what I read, but of feeling something new, of being affected by something that made the look of the world different. Uh, yes, this man was fighting, fighting with words. He was using words as weapons, using them as one could use a club. Could words be weapons? Well, yes, but here they were. Then maybe perhaps I could use them as a weapon. No, it frightened me. I read on, and what amazed me was not what he said, but how on earth anybody had the courage to say it. So as you study right and you continue to read his work, you'll see that he found the courage to, uh, to present the realities of the South in such graphic ways that it, it unnerves people if they read a Black boy or if they read Native Son. Uh, it's, it's the, the works are very dark and unnerving. Next slide, please. From Blueprint on the, Har uh, on the Harlem Renaissance writers. Right, well, and as I transition into this, so Mencken was a critic, and Wright, Wright was so inspired by that that he wrote critically the same way, but he uh, criticized writers of the Harlem Renaissance that we all respect in academia. We think they're great. We think Zora Neale Hurston is great. We think uh, Langston Hughes is great. We think all of those writers are great. But Wright uh, was so critical. And one of the things that he said in Blueprint on the uh, Blueprint of Negro writing, he said, Negro writing in the past has been confined to humble novels, poems, and plays, prim and decorous ambassadors who went a begging to white America. They entered the court of American public opinion, dressed in the knee pants of servility, curtsying to show that the Negro was not inferior, that he was human, and that he had a life comparable to that of other people. For the most artistic ambassadors were received as though they were French poodles who do clever tricks. That's a very powerful, powerful statement uh, to make about Harlem Renaissance writers, to say that they were received as basically dogs who did tricks of white people, if I translate 
And um, so, think bigger. Uh, he's an interesting figure, but he was influenced by Mencken. And later when he became, after he gets Black Boy published, he, it basically is a game changer for him. He, 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 he does join the Communist Party, but when you read and you study him, he was communist. And I think Steve Davis is going to touch on some of this, so I don't want to go over into his presentation, but he was communist, not because he necessarily wanted to be, but it gave him access to the type of writing and the magazines, the journals that he wanted and needed access to, uh, to be able to do the reading and the studying that he wanted to do as a Black writer. It offered freedom and openness, and they accepted him in that circle. But he was very much his own thinker. And I think when he left the party, it was because of the influence that uh, too much influence on his writing he wanted more freedom, uh, even, even that, and he ended up leaving, he left the South for the North. He ended up leaving the United States altogether to to live in Europe and basically rejecting everything Southern and everything American in many many ways. And so Mencken, real quick before we transition to Steve, uh, Steve's talk is uh, he was the editor of this American Mercury magazine for about nine years. And as his biographer, Marion Elizabeth Rogers have said, and these are her words, not mine, he published 54 articles in the American Mercury by about or for black writers, 15 editorials, promoted writers that we do recognize now uh, as Harlem Renaissance writers, uh, with his motto, I think it's Marion Elizabeth Rogers, his biographer, who says this, that he dispensed with stereotypes and tried to depict the complexity or published writers who depicted the complexity of uh, black life in America in the 1920s. And with that, Steve, it's yours. Okay, so uh, yeah, Cindy provided the perfect transition. By the time we get to my phase, the latter part of his life, he had become famous. Uh, Native Son was a bestseller. Black Boy was as well. He moved to Chicago and New York. There was a period when he was not only famous, but he was making a fair share of money. But yet he still wasn't entirely happy. So I want to start with a quote from Black Boy. I won't read the whole thing. What's happened is Richard's working in the same optical company that Cindy referred to. And there was one of his coworkers who approached him one day and said, you know, I'm from the North. I don't think the way a lot of these people around here think and that well intentioned white man didn't realize that he was putting this black man in a very, very difficult situation. And that's where Richard says he had mentioned a tabooed subject and I wanted to wait until I knew what he meant. Among the topics the Southern white men did not like to discuss with Negroes were the following. We could spend a whole period breaking down this list and talking about why every one of these these topics was taboo. But I put in bold France. France <laughs> is one of those things that's on the list because of the experience of black men who had served in the military during World War I and who it had encountered a far greater tolerance. It's not to say that the French can't be racist, but compared to what they had known in the United States, it was like a utopia. And uh, that uh, certainly was something Richard Wright had known for a long time. So next slide, please, John. One of the people who inspired him who had lived in France for a long while since the early 1900s was Gertrude Stein. And she was a modernist writer renowned for her, her style who lived on uh, what's called the West, uh, not the West Bank, the left bank and uh, had uh, had gathered had organized a salon, meaning in her home, she would she would uh, she would have uh, host of soirees host meetings of intellectuals and writers and the like, and they would they would socialize and exchange ideas. And uh, she and Richard Wright very much admired one another. He had written a great a glowing review of uh, one of her books toward the end of uh, World War II, and she had read Black Boy and wrote him a letter and told him how much uh, she, uh, she enjoyed that. So uh, Gertrude Stein had said at one point, all roads lead to Paris. And Richard Wright, I'll quote from his journal, uh, in the spring of 1945, he said, I dream and dream of leaving my native land, 
to escape the pressure of superficial things. That's why I left the South, and now I want to leave the entire country, and someday I will, by God. So he kept he kept going. Obviously, um, life in the North was so far superior to life in the Jim Crow South, but it still uh, fell far short of his ideal expectations. Next slide, please. So he went to Paris by 1946, and right away, as soon as he got there, he said, it's just so beautiful. Uh, just to, just again, the physical surroundings, I think it was his enchantment with the place and the freedom. That's the key thing. The freedom that it represented and one thing was to find the freedom to uh, find a great bookstore. And we've already talked about the role that books had played in his life. And this was 1 of his, the bookstores on the left bank that Richard favored. Next slide, please. Uh, you would also, if you lived in Paris, need to, to find to, to determine your favorite cafe to kind of establish a kind of a home away from home. Um, after the war, conditions were hard in France. A lot of uh, homes weren't very well heated, and uh, going to a cafe and not just drinking a coffee but lingering, it would provide space to write and space to socialize with some of your your acquaintances in the literary set and what have you. And Richard said, you know, when I went to a cafe in Paris, I didn't have to wait on the door step and wonder uh, if I were to go in the door and asked to be served, whether I'd be disrespected or refused service or what have you. And uh, I'll note another difference too, and he didn't have to worry that someone would cause a commotion because his wife was white. That's his wife right there, Ellen Poplar, who's sitting next to him. And I think what the picture conveys is just how animated and happy uh, Richard seems in this surrounding. So his uh, go-to cafe was not Starbucks for a long time. It was the Cafe Tournant. Uh, that, was, uh, that was where he eventually decided that was his he was a cafe intellectual in the truest sense of the term. Next slide, please. Uh, in Paris, Richard would uh, associate with uh, famous intellectuals, the, the friend of uh, people like uh, Simone de Beauvoir, who was the partner, pretty much the lifelong partner of Jean-Paul Sartre. And so existentialism was a, a philosophy that was becoming very, very popular in the aftermath of World War II. And some of Richard's writings are going to be influenced by that in this period of time. The next slide, please. Uh, and uh, one of the problems is, though, guys, there were other Americans in France and in Paris, and we weren't just exporting manufactured goods to France after World War II. Sometimes we were exporting there some hateful, some hateful attitudes because uh, Richard became more and more aware. It wasn't just the ex expatriates, uh, the expats, the literary intellectual figures. There were American businessmen there. More and more, there were tourists, American tourists in France in the 1950s. And uh, one man who uh, was one of Richard's close friends, and I would say became an ally, was the great uh, Swedish uh, economist Gunnar Myrdal, who later wins the Nobel Prize. And uh, he had spent a lot of time in the United States, and he studied racism here and wrote this uh, magnificent uh, two-volume classic, An American Dilemma. It came out during the war, 1944, when that question was being raised, the, the, the difference, the gap between America persons of color and uh, some black people uh, especially. So Gunnar Myrdal was very familiar with this, what was then called the Negro problem. That was kind of the phrase for the race question at that time. And uh, he was uh, in Paris and became a close friend of, of Richard's. On one occasion, uh, Gunnar Myrdal was working for the United Nations and he had some meeting he needed to attend in Geneva. And uh, he and Richard were driving from Paris uh, to Switzerland. And about halfway there, they stopped to stay overnight in a town called Bonn in the in the in the best hotel there. And uh, Gunnar Myrdal was with Richard when he tried to check in. And it was one of these things. Other people had been getting their rooms, but all of a sudden we don't have any rooms left for you. And uh and it happened once and it happened again. And Richard had 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 to deal with this kind of stuff in in his life many, many times. But Gunnar Myrdal stepped up and he slapped down his diplomatic passport at one point. He said, you know something, you people are going to hear about this. And all of a sudden there was a room available. So uh, Richard said later, though, when they went down to dinner in the dining room, the dining room was packed with American tourists. And when they walked in, it was dead silence because those Americans had brought their attitude there that a black man just doesn't uh, belong in a place of this kind. So they wanted to impose that kind of that kind of racist uh, mindset and practice uh, in Europe. And Richard was obviously dismayed by that. Now I have the picture of pagan Spain up there because it was Gunnar, uh, Gunnar Myrdal and his wife Alva who suggested to Richard, you know, you should go to Spain and it would, it would be a good subject, a good place for you to visit 
and report on and the like. And he went to Spain in 1954 and 1955. And the end result was this book, Pagan Spain, which is not a novel. It's a it's non-fictional work. It's a travel log to some degree. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things he did, and of course the cover features that, is he attended a bullfight, and uh, it was at this bull ring in. Barcelona. Uh, I've seen that bull ring from a distance. Uh, by the way, it's still there, but they don't have bullfights there anymore. And that's because the people of that province, Catalonia, outlawed bullfighting some years ago. There are other parts of Spain where this uh, still goes on. But he says, I saw upon the facade of a massive brick building fronting the stadium a gigantic emblem of the Falange, the symbol of the yoke and arrows dating from the time of Ferdinand and Isabella. So that's a reference to the fact that Spain was under a fascistic dictatorship uh, headed by uh, General Franco, who had triumphed in the Spanish Civil War, and very much based upon the power, the orthodoxy, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, and tradition dating back to Spain's golden age, the powerful monarchy, the central rule, and that kind of thing. Next kind of slide, pl next slide, please. And uh, this is an excerpt from the bullfight. Um, I want to say that this. This segment of the book uh, is about 25 pages in length, and it is terrible. It is not terrible in terms of the style. It is brilliantly written, but it is terrible because of the subject matter, because of the graphic way that Richard Wright is able to describe what he saw. Here's just a little excerpt to give you a sense. The bull trotted this way and that, thrashing his gigantic body about to rid himself of those hooks in the flesh, and the candy-colored sticks bobbed and flapped like circus pennants, waving in the wind, shaving the tissues anew, causing tiny streaks of scarlet to ooze down his forelegs each step he took. And this is only the first stage of that bloody dance where the banderilleros come and they stick they stick the bull with those those prongs, those hooked barbs. They stick it into the hump behind his back. There are three of them who do that, and then the picadors come out on horseback, and then the matador finishes the the bull up. And it's it's you know I've read some of the bullfighting writings of, of Hemingway, and they're justly uh, famous and uh, justly highly regarded, but I, they don't compare to what Richard Wright conveyed. When he says pagan Spain, he means there are layers below the current day Spain that appears to be a Christian nation. You have the Romans and the Celts and the Visigoths and the like, and there's a lot of pagan tradition that endures. Next slide, please. Now, another thing he did, uh, he writes again another travel book. Um, uh, this one came out actually before Pagan Spain. There were some friends of his in uh, Britain who said, you ought to go to the, what was then called the Gold Coast. But the Gold Coast was uh, in the process of becoming an, one of the first uh, African countries to attain its independence, in this case from British rule, uh, uh, under the dynamic, the charismatic leadership of Kwame Nkrumah, who's pictured there on the left. And the book that resulted, which came out in 1954, Black Power, which is a phrase we associate with Stokely Carmichael uh, uh, you later on in the 1960s. But what he means by black power is not something sinister, black supremacy, something like that. He just means that black people are going to determine their own affairs. They're going to run their own country, uh, as they rightly should do. An American Negro visits the African Gold Coast. Gold Coast was the British name for this colony. It becomes Ghana in the near future by the author of Native Son and Black Boy. So you see he's already identified by these famous best-selling works. Next slide, please. Let me give you some quick excerpts. Again, to give you a sense of Richard's style. Go further, John, there we go. Uh, emerging from the custom shed, I saw Africa for the first time with frontal vision. Black life was everywhere. Imagine how that felt to Richard who had been in the minorities so many times in his life, but here this was, this was a black nation in every respect. The next quote, please, if you can show me that. As I sat at the table, my three men disappeared, their coarse soles feet swishing over the highly polished wooden floor. I sighed. This was Africa, too. But that pigeon English, I shuddered, I resented it, and I vowed that I never speak it. And Cindy, this reminded me of some of Zora Neale Hurston because she writes as a folklorist in, in black dialect, right? And he didn't like that. And you know, he's a little harsh here because those men weren't speaking that way because they were trying to seem childish or simplistic, trying to corrupt the English language. That's just what they had learned. It was a corrupted form of the language that he had so much come to, to love. The next quote, please. Some of his ob observations here. I was astonished to see women stripped to the waist, 
do a sort of weaving circular motion with their bodies, a kind of physical manner. It was if uh, it, it, it expressed their joy in a quiet physical manner. It, it was as if they were talking with the movements of their legs, arms, necks, and torsos. And then I remembered I'd seen these same snake-like varying dances before where, oh God, yes, in America, in storefront churches, in holy roller tabernacles, in God's temples, in unpainted wooden prayer meeting houses on the plantations of the deep south. And here I was seeing it all again against a background of a surging nationalist political movement. How could that be? Well, what we're witnessing are cultural survivals, of course. All of this was carried by slaves over hundreds of years to parts of the United States like Mississippi, which had given this native son his, his own birth. And the last quote, please. And this echoes Cindy from an open letter he wrote to Kwame Nkrumah at the end of the book. With words as our weapons, there are some few of us who will stand on the ramparts to fend off the evildoers, the slanderers, the greedy, and the self righteous You are not alone. That brings it full circle. Next slide. As I begin now to wrap it up, uh, Richard uh, died, and as uh, Cindy pointed out, in 1960 in Paris. He was buried along with a lot of other great artists, uh, including some expats, but great French and other uh, figures in the Père Lachaise. And uh, next time I go, I, you know, I didn't know to look for his ashes there, but uh, but there they are. And so that leaves us with the question now. Uh, let's see the next slide if we can, please. Richard was part of the Great Migration. He represented that movement to the north, uh, primarily to the north, some to the west coast as well, starting in Mississippi and places like Jackson. Memphis was the way station. Then take the Illinois Central, the, the IC Railroad up to Chicago. Uh, and uh, Sir Richard is very much part of that important theme in American history. The next slide, please. And this raises a question. Um, would he come back? Uh, would he migrate to this? Would, because there, so what the what the chart is showing us here is that for a, for the longest time, and you can see the Great Migration, the percentage of Black people who live in the South in this country begins to decline around 1900. It especially accelerates with World War One and World War Two, and it, that percentage continues to go down and down and down. So notice what happens in the part that John has circled. In 1970, it stabilizes, and we've had some slight uptick in the percentage since that time. So this is the question, you know, I've often thought about. What if Richard Wright had lived to 1970 to 1980, whatever, after the great legislation had been passed? Would that have made enough difference for him to rethink his exile and return to the United States? Uh, because we've clearly had some blacks who've moved to the north begin to uh, involve themselves in a reverse migration since things seemingly have gotten better. Would that have included Richard Wright as well? So I thought about that, and Cindy, I heard what you said in a prior presentation, and at first I was kind of in disagreement, but I, you know, let me just show you the next slide, and, and I'll, I'll tell you where, where I've come down on this. I don't want to say too much about this picture because I think this picture conveys a lot when that man is putting his hand on the Bible and being sworn in as the president of our country. Now, a lot of us, when that happened, 2016, 2017, were blindsided and thought, how in the world can someone as racist, let me be blunt, as Donald Trump and as unqualified for the office, nonetheless be in the White House? And I think Richard Wright would have said, you know what? I'm just not that surprised. There's some things in our culture, sadly, that endure. And I think that would have given him fundamental pause. So uh, I'll end it there. I've come around to the point of view that I think Richard would not have been sold on the idea that things have fundamentally changed. Uh, he wasn't, you know, uh, entirely happy away from his from his country, but I think he would have continued to um, do the best he could with that kind of a distant life. So the last slide, please, John. I think where we are now is for, for the reach. So that's all I have, and we can talk then about some of the books we think, other than the books we've mentioned that you might have put on your list. We, uh, and we're gonna take any questions that y'all have in the audience. We just did want to encourage you, if you want to pursue uh, any of these writers, uh, either of these writers, excuse me, in their works, where, what, what might you do? What uh, and for Mencken, there is a collection of his writings that he edited himself right before his major stroke in 1948 that incapacitated him, his Crestomathy, and these are his, his favorite writings, and that's a good place to start for Mencken.
if you're really ambitious, his book on the American language, uh, it's huge, but uh, most people who get it, they love it. That's another area. Uh, or his autobiographies called the Days Trilogy, now out in a modern or Library of America edition. Those are very optimistic. Uh, Mencken's reputation went way downhill in the 1930s mm -hmm. and because uh, he hated Roosevelt, wrote against him so much. And with his reputation, with Mencken's reputation in exile, like Wright, I suppose, at a way, in a way, uh, he turned to autobiography and those are very pleasant uh, writings. Uh, for Richard Wright, of course, you have a uh, native son. Uh, his uh, mo probably his most famous novel, uh, which is definitely worth uh, consulting and reading. Uh, there's his memoir, which Cindy referenced uh, several times today in her presentation, uh, Black Boy. These are you can find both of these at bookstores. You can find Mingan's Crestomathy there as well, and uh, a new book that's been published posthumously by Richard Wright uh, by the Library of America called The Man Who Lived Underground. And then Cindy also recommended uh, to me this morning uh, Blueprint for uh, Negro Writing, which had been published in 1937. If you were interested in a biography of Mencken, there's many. The one I think is the easiest to read, written by the journalist, the Wall Street Journal's uh, theater critic, Terry Teachout, and it's simply called The Skeptic, A Life of H.L. Mencken. Uh, and I like it because even though it may not be as comprehensive as some other biographies, he's a good writer and it's a manageable length. And then, and then the other one here for Richard Wright, the Hazel Rowley volume, Richard Wright, The Life and Times. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I want to take, uh, or we want to take questions. You can ask any of us in the chat box, any question that you want. Wow, we've got quite a bit of people here. So what questions do y'all have that we could answer? You can ask Cindy, you can ask myself, or you can ask Steve. It can be a Mencken question, a Richard Wright question, or an off, or a, some other type of question, and we'll do our best to answer it. Who's got a question for us? Don't be shy. Let's see here, okay. Let's see. What purposes, Cindy and Steve, here we go. What purposes did Mencken and Wright intend in their writing that posterity has forgotten? What purpose did they intend in their writing? Yeah, like what, what, in other words, what, what's a, what's a, um, I think to reword the, the question, what was, what was central in their writing that we've kind of forgotten about them? I think what's central in Wright's writing is to be, uh, is, is to be, uh, well, I don't want to use the word proud of who you are. Use writing as a way to advance uh, the cause of the of the American people. If someone's been uh, oppressed or marginalized in some way, use your writing and your in your words as weapons to advocate uh, for others. And I think that's something that maybe we might forget and is pushed over into the social sciences in some way. I I hope that addresses the question. I think that's something. Well, I, I think that Wright's enduring theme is very much continues. It hasn't been lost to posterity. The, the theme is is to struggle for freedom, to struggle for dignity. Um, he became a communist in the first place because he thought there was a need for radical change, and he admired the Communist Party's program in areas like race relation, but ultimately the Communist Party wasn't about freedom. As Cindy said, they were going to dictate to him what he could and couldn't write, and he, he didn't, he remained a man of the left. But he couldn't be a communist, uh, even though he was served the party well for a number of years. But I think freedom and and the enduring issue of addressing, frankly, racism, which I think we we tried to do in our presentations today. I think I think for Mencken, in part, that's a really complicated question. Uh, I think Mencken's emphasis on free speech. Uh, he was a he called himself, I think, at one point, a free speech fanatic, and. Um, as unpleasant, and I think I've got a quote here. Uh, yes, this is about, uh, it, it's about Nazis in New York City in the 1930s that uh, 
that he called morons. Uh, <laughs> and he says, uh, Mencken said this, it is unpleasant to be deafened day in and day out by the agents of preposterous and usually dishonest arcana. It would be far more unpleasant to live in a country wherein even the meanest and stupidest man was forbidden to disseminate his delusions. If we can stand having hordes of quacks engage in endless exchanges of imbecility in Congress and the state legislatures, then I, so, I see no reason why we would, should fear to let other quacks make a den outside for communism, Nazism, or for that matter, even cannibalism. <laughs> so, Mencken, I think he was a free speech fanatic, and I think his wit, uh, his, 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 and his, exagger his use of exaggeration to wittily express an idea has been maybe forgotten. There's a lot of sanctimony in our society today. Uh, and that, you know, applies to literature too, I think, in many ways. I, th I think too, I'd like to say, John, the Bright's life is a good example of how we can use books and ideas to transform ourselves. That he came from nothing, and yet right. he became an esteemed writer and, and moved in these elevated circles. And I think a lot of us can identify with that and should continue to see that as an inspiration. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. That's that's true. And Mencken, you know, his dad was a, a cigar maker um, and wanted his son to go into the cigar making business. And uh, Mencken didn't want to do that. And Lincoln, Mencken later said, you know, his dad, his dad died. And that actually turned out to be very fortunate for him because he wanted to be a reporter. And that might have been more difficult for him to do had his father not passed away at a young at a young age. Other questions? We're not getting a lot of questions. Surely there's some other questions here. Our presentation couldn't have been that thorough. Let's see here. Okay. No one else? Joan, if you're there, surely you've got a question or one or anyone else? Well, John, do you think that um, Minkin was in any way an ally for African Americans at that time? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I mean, I think he was. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean by ally. I mean, you know, in terms of his promotion of good, serious literature, yes. His devotion to the truth, certainly, yes. Uh, and certainly, black newspapers saw him that way. Uh, the Chicago Defender, the New York, the Amsterdam News, and other black newspapers, they, they saw his attacks upon the stultifying culture at large as something that was important. And I think it was, uh, I think Zora Neale Hurston called him, a, a, he was not what she called a Negrotarian. And what he, she meant by that was he wasn't a liberal do-gooder. You know, uh, and I think George Schuyler said that too, that, you know, these liberals that he thought were quite nauseating, he said, Minkin was never one of those guys, you know, and uh, so I think in a way, yeah, I think so, even though he certainly uh, had his race prejudices, uh, certainly that's the case, and I don't want to minimize those. John, I'd like to close with myself with an exhortation and Richard Wright loved to travel, and that was such an important part of who he was and of his overall education. So I hope there are students out there listening, and you know, I hope this inspires you to say, you know, just like Richard Wright, I want to go to Paris. I, I didn't go to Paris until I was 64 years old, and I know what Richard Wright was talking about, and I hope you'll do that. And there's a there's a wider world out there. And when he went to Spain and when he went to Ghana, it showed that he was always interested in learning and exposing himself to new cultures and new ideas. So use him as an inspiration in that respect too. Sure. And maybe uh, get one of those books we mentioned uh, or suggested. And you can find those at Barnes and Noble even today, which tells you a little bit about the influence of these of these two men on our on our on our world, uh, certainly. And with that, I don't see any other questions. Uh, let me double check it. And uh, yep, I think we are done. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks so Thank much. You. All right. See you. Thanks.